behind me is not the Titanic. It is a floating dry dock. And inside that floating dry dock is our ship, DD661, USS Kid. Today I'm gonna go over what is a floating dry dock, a little bit of how it works, and then its history and why they're so important. My name is Elijah Otto, curator at the USS Kid Veterans Museum. Let's take a look. The first question I know you're gonna ask me is what even is a floating dry dock? Okay, so a floating dry dock is a dock that floats. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so, really what it is, it is a dock, okay? And we can do several things with it that we can be able to fit a ship inside of it and lift it and raise it out of the water. So what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be its purpose, task fulfillment, that sort of thing, with what even is a dry dock and why we care so much about it. In World War II, especially in the Pacific Theater, we have to think about logistics, which is a fancy term for supply lines, okay? Kind of like how a mailman takes mail from one place, delivers it to another place. Logistics is what we would call that in this field. So, floating dry docks serve a really, really important purpose, okay? When you have a ship that's several thousand miles from the nearest dock that can support her, it's gonna take not only a lot of time, sometimes several months, getting her from the front line where she's hit, or taking damage all the way back across the Pacific to several island bases, and then eventually into the United States where she can dock and get repaired, okay? That takes a lot of time, okay? In warfare, especially in the Central Pacific, which the kids served through, we need to be able to go from one island to the next. We can't stop, and we can't have any sort of reprieve. So, the Navy thought about this solution a long, long time before, in 1900, the United States Navy Bureau of Yards and Docks put out a thing and saying, hey, we need to take a look and experiment with floating dry docks. So their solution came in 1905 and in 1906 with the first three yard floating docks or YFDs, okay? So first one, it looks a lot like this right here. And what their purpose is, is to get access to the ships underwater compartments. So that's things like the rudder, the propeller, propeller shafts, stuff like that. So as an example, let's say we have this destroyer behind us in the Pacific, it takes a hit, something happens to it below the water line. We're not gonna again waste all that time bringing her back to the United States. We're gonna take this dry dock and we're gonna tow it and float it all the way to the front line. This way we can repair her in weeks instead of months. So how is that done? So first things first, what we have in this dock is a U-shape. There are two what are called wing walls and then a uh, pontoon deck. These wing walls are filled with ballast tanks. Ballast is what it keeps things afloat. Uh, for example, on a ship, it would usually be uh, ballast stones or something like that, weighted items. Here inside these walls is actually water and air. So what they'll do to get the USS Kid in position is they actually sunk these walls by pumping her full of water. Goes down, 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 down until we have enough clearance and then ship gets maneuvered inside, rests on those keel blocks. Then air gets flushed in, pushes the water out and then rises it back up. And now we have access to those underwater parts. So we take care of those parts, we repair them, we do what we need to and then we do the same thing, just in reverse, put the pontoon down, bring the ship out, now she's ready for action. Another question I'm pretty sure you're gonna ask me is how do we get this thing all the way out into the ocean and then to where it needs to go? Like for example, YFD2, Dewey, was built in Maryland, transported via tug or pushboat all the way down to the New Orleans area it had received a really big reception by the mayor of New Orleans. They had a parade and everything. But how did they get that there? So these things don't have their own power. What I mean by that is that they don't have any sort of engines or anything like that. Some of them do have rudders to help with mobility, but they don't have any sort of external power source. They do have their own internal source. They are meant to be self-sustaining. So we can just put them into a, a bay or a harbor, and this way we can just bring the ship to them. Now something of this size um, would feature a crew of about 60 men, 
and about five to 10 officers. Kind of just depends who's there at that time. And what they would do, a lot of them, of course, are not going to be, you know, gunner's mates or anything like that. Uh, they're going to be your carpenters, your mechanics, your steel workers, your electricians, that sort of thing. And that's going to fill up the complement uh, and crew for these type of uh, vessels. Where do they live and what do they do is another really good question I get asked. So what would be alongside these are actually other barges. So you're not just towing the dock itself, you're towing a barge and that's usually where the crew slept. Uh, the mess deck and stuff like that would be located on a barge so they would go to lunchtime, get off the dock, eat chow, come back onto the dock and then work. So like I said, this one would feature about 60 crew members. Uh, larger ones, of course, you're going to get more and more. Uh, the advanced support dock that I talked about, that one is going to have uh, several hundred men working on it at one time. In terms of its development, like I said, in 1900, we developed three of them. By World War II, the United States had three of these in service. One was in the Philippines, USS Dewey. I believe it is the only named floating dry dock. These docks don't have any class or anything like that. So USS Dewey is in Subic Bay in the Philippines. Japanese come in. We realize we're not going to hold on to this dock. So we actually sink that dock. When the Japanese come rolling in, in April, in May, June of 42, they actually find this floating dry dock, say they can use it, and they actually raise it up, and they start using it for their own purposes. Well. Several years later, in November of 44, US and allies realized that they're using our own floating dock. So we go back and we actually sink the floating dock with a couple of torpedo hits. And that's that one's service. The other service is YFD-2. And this one actually has a really, really good service. So this one was based in Pearl Harbor. On December 7th, 1941, YFD-2 had a destroyer similar to this one. Uh, was a quite a little bit smaller, uh, the USS Shaw. And when the attack happened, the Shaw was hit, his forward magazine actually got hit, and it damaged the floating dry dock around it as well. But ingenuity, the US Navy, were actually able to raise both of the dock in the ship, and we put them both back in service within six months. The floating dry dock YF-2 services a lot of combat ships. It doesn't do anything big or fancy like a carrier or a battleship. It's too small for that, but we'll get into those other ones. And it services destroyers, fleet tugs, auxiliaries, like oilers, stuff like that. And it does that throughout the entirety of the year, or entirety of the war. The other one is going to be ASB-1, which is going to be an auxiliary floating dock. And this one had service all throughout the Pacific Ocean. It goes, it goes and stops in a place called Espiritu Santo, which is a territory of ours south of the Solomons and then goes up to Guadalcanal and then up through the South Pacific. And this one services uh, similar ships, destroyers, uh, anything that's got about 3,000 ton payload, which a destroyer has. And so those are the three that we started out with. Now, as time goes on and we realize we have to push to Japan, we got to start cranking these things out. So the industrial might of the United States is in full play here, so we generate over 150 of these yard floating docks or dry docks. And they're gonna come into various sizes. They come as little as this one, which services the smallest type of ships, including the destroyer. And then it goes bigger, 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 and bigger. The biggest one we have is the Advanced Support Base Dock, or ASBD-1. And this one is kind of weird. So, it has segments. Think of segments of, of like, a, like a hand or an arm, okay? So you have several segments that connect, okay? This ASBD-1 comes in and it actually has segments, 10 of them. And if you put all 10 of these segments together, it has a lift capacity of 100,000 tons, which I did bench press a couple days ago. I can't lift that just yet, but this one can, okay? And that one services our big capital ships. So destroy uh, battleships like the Idaho in California, uh, carriers, fleet carriers like the big Essex class like Lexington, uh, even smaller carriers, uh, light carriers. Those are what they service. Okay. 
One of these got sent all the way to Okinawa in 45 to help service the amount of ships that were being damaged uh, during that campaign. And it actually got awarded a battle star. So it's one of two docks that I know of that have battle stars, the other one being YFD-2 for Pearl Harbor. Without these, the war would have lasted into 46 and 47, just because we couldn't replace the 7,000 ships that were used in these type of docks. Underplayed, underrolled, or undervalued piece of logistics history. So with this, we get to take a look at it. Don't forget to check out our previous live streams where we actually film the ship going in and out. And Tim Nesmith, our ship superintendent, actually does a little commentary on it. If you have any questions, please ask in the comments. I will not answer them. I'm just kidding, I'll answer them, I'll answer them. So, other than that, come check out our channel to learn more about cool stuff like this.